Hello, welcome to SYPA in Focus, the Pensions Authority's annual report for 23-24. I'm George Graham, I'm the Authority's Director, and myself and Debbie Sharp, our Assistant Director for Pensions, will be explaining to you what's gone on at the Authority during the year and how our investments have performed. And for the investments, I want to talk a bit about how the investments have performed, how we go about investing responsibly on your behalf and um, a bit of looking to the future because there's a lot of uh, stuff going on in the wider world of pensions that will affect SYPA over the coming years. So what's been going on in the wider world? Well, it's all been a bit up and down in the financial markets over the years. Um, much performance in, in the equity market in traditional shares has been driven by the performance of the so-called magnificent seven US tech stocks like Google and Apple. And they've driven the American market much higher. We've seen interest rates rise during the year, the last year, they've subsequently been cut and the world economy avoided a recession, but there have been significant regional differences in, in growth and inflation, and the UK seems to have lagged particularly in, ter in terms of the rate at which inflation has come down and the rate of growth. Um, both the US and Japan were bright spots compared to the, the UK, and while the outlook seems to be better than it, it has been, there is a continuing sort of feeling of uncertainty in the markets, partly driven by international events like the war in Ukraine and uh, conflict in the Middle East, but also by um, the potential for the results of the large number of elections which are taking place during 2024, um, causing disturbance in the financial markets as new governments change economic policies in various ways. So, how did the fund do? So this, this chart shows how the fund's done over one, three, five, and ten, and 10 years. And the light pink bar to the left of, of each group, it shows how the fund has actually done while the other two bars are. The, the lighter of the other two bars is the performance of a benchmark, so the same mix of assets as we hold. And then the dark bar is what the actuary assumes we need to uh, return in order to deliver pensions. So over all periods, we've beaten the actuarially assumed return. We were slightly behind the benchmark last year, but um, ahead of it over longer periods, which is what we need to do. We're a longer term investor. We, you know, one, one year numbers are not necessarily representative of us achieving the longer term targets that we need to achieve to pay benefits going out in the into the 2100s. So in terms of how individual types of assets have performed o over the year, clearly the, stand the standout um, was international equities, who, which have consistently done well over many years. Um, performance of the, the UK mandate was slightly behind it, its benchmark, and it, but uh, over the longer term it has outperformed its benchmark. Fixed income investments, that's investments in various types of bonds, have underperformed to a significant degree over the last few years due to the interest rate environment, and again that continued through the last year. Um, Private equity fund investments appear to be behind target in the last year. This seems largely due to the fact that um, there have been fewer deals done to sell on companies held in, pri in private equity funds. And this uh, means that we haven't realized the value to the same degree as we have in previous years. There's some evidence now that that's beginning to unwind in the current year. Um, and there's a similar issue with infrastructure funds have also been affected by the interest rate environment. So 
So longer term, equity performance has done better than benchmark, which is what we would want to see. That's where growth in the fund come, comes from as a private equity investment. With the other alternative investments, yeah, ma matching or slightly exceeding their benchmark, driving that longer term performance. And you know, fixed income underperforming for the same reasons as we've talked about before, and property very much in line with the benchmark. The value of the fund's assets has been growing. Different things have been happening with the value of the liabilities, the value of which is significantly affected by the rate of interest on government debt. As the rate of interest on government debt rises, the way the valuation methodology works, the lower the value of uh, value of liabilities because you need to invest less now in gilt at uh, gilt edge securities in order to achieve the same level of return return and achieve a, a fixed value at a point future point in time. So we can see that over the periods we're looking at the value of um, the fund's liabilities has reduced by about 30%, which is a significant change um, over time. So, in summary, we're seeing long-term stable growth in our assets, which is exactly what we want to see. The value of liabilities has moved favourably for the fund, largely due to factors outside our control, but those factors could easily reverse. But the overall position provides a good basis going into the next valuation year, although around all of that there's still a considerable amount of uncertainty. That's how we've performed. What about how we invest and investing responsibly? We take our responsibilities in this area very seriously. That means that we make sure that all of the rights of ownership which come with owning shares or bonds or any other form of asset are exercised, whether that's directly, where we, we still own assets directly, or through the Border to Coast Partnership, where we invest in products that they provide. We provide a lot of information every quarter on our activity in this area, which is available on our website, and alongside our annual report, and this version of our annual report, we've also published separate reports on stewardship, which is how we exercise the responsibilities of being an asset owner, and on our impact on the climate. So you can see here that votes were cast on our behalf 8,923 times at nearly 700 meetings of different companies in, in four different portfolios. We voted against management in 13% of cases, which is uh, an increase on, on previous years. That was often because uh, we disagreed with management on um, the approach being taken to, to climate, where we will vote against the chair of the company being re-elected. Sometimes it was against um, reappointing the chair of a remuneration and nomination committee where we feel that the diversity of a company's board isn't sufficiently wide. There are a range of policies that are, you can access through our website which explain how uh, we decide which way we're going to vote on particular issues. And we also make available details of each individual vote that um, has been made on our behalf through the Bordered Coast website. So the other side of voting is engagement, talking to companies before you actually vote at their annual meeting about the things that you think are important, or diversity, executive pay, climate, all of these other key, key issues. And 
we made over 1,500 examples of engagement were made over the course of the year on our behalf, which is a very significant number. About 40% of those were in the UK, and 45% of those related to climate, which is a significant risk to the future value of many companies in which we're invested. We thought it would be interesting to explain how Border to Coast have engaged with four different companies on our behalf to try and influence their behaviour towards the environment in a way which makes sure that they're looking after the environment in a way which we would all approve of. So Border to Coast were very concerned that Shell and BP both rode back on their commitments to invest more in moving their companies from being pure oil and gas companies to being energy providers, including delivering renewables. So they met with the companies, discussed their plans, and ultimately they voted against the re-election of the, the chairs of the companies, which is a significant signal to the companies that they want, along with many other shareholders, to see the companies moving faster in the direction of turning their companies from being oil and gas companies into being energy providers that are part of the engine of the transition to a net zero economy. The significant concern about the pollution of our rivers um, by water companies discharging sewage into, into rivers. Border to Coast is part of a collaborative engagement process with a range of other investors and is the lead uh, organisation engaging with Yorkshire Water. Border to Coast met with Yorkshire Water and discussed their plans for improving their performance in this area and while the discussions were positive we're not yet satisfied that Yorkshire Water and Northumbrian Water, the other major company that Border to Coast are engaging with in this area, are doing enough and we're continuing to talk to them to ensure that they improve, both improve their performance in this area. We all like to go on holiday. Many of us, when we go on holiday, travel by air. Air travel is clearly a significantly polluting way of getting about the world, although clearly something that makes travel incredibly convenient for all of us. Airlines have for a number of years been trying to reduce their emissions by using different types of fuel, buying new and less polluting aircraft. And Border Coast have been talking to EasyJet about how fast they are making these changes and the sort of changes they, they're making to, to go ahead. The discussion has been positive. EasyJet are doing things that we would want to see them doing. They're not doing enough yet. We'd like them to do more. So that engagement is carrying on and we'll see more results from that in the coming year. So people often ask me what we're doing about climate change and why we don't just take all our money out of oil and gas companies. Well, we're actually doing a significant amount on climate change. And as I've said, we've published a separate report on what we're doing about climate, which is available on our website. But that includes investing a significant amount of, of money in new technologies which will support the transition to a no or low carbon economy and in things like renewable energy to a far greater extent than we are actually investing now in oil and gas companies. So we've got more green than brown investments to, to use some of the jargon. But why don't we just sell our shares in Shell and BP? Well, the answer is actually relatively simple. On a financial basis, and we have to start on a financial basis, there's no justification for doing so. But equally, if we sold our shares in those companies, we'd lose the ability to influence their transition to becoming part of the solution to the climate change problem, rather than 
um, part of the problem. And companies like Shell and BP have moved largely because shareholders have been putting pressure on them. Have they moved fast enough? Have they moved far enough? No. But they will only continue to move when they're reacting to what we as shareholders are telling them. If, if we look to the future, the government have launched a pensions review. They're very keen that pension funds, both in the private sector and public sector funds like LGPS, invest more in the UK economy and in supporting growth in the UK economy. They also want to address what they see as fragmentation and inefficiency within LGPS. So by that they mean looking at the number of pools and the number of funds to create bigger pools of capital which they feel will invest more to support the UK economy. Now these are matters of debate, there's consultation ongoing and in uh, government at, at the moment and we don't know what the results of that process will be. Our job at SYPA is to make sure we run the scheme in the best interests of scheme members under whatever rules and whatever framework is in place at the time. We believe that we are a well-run, well-governed and efficient uh, organisation running the pension fund and we're certainly one of the largest funds within the local government pension scheme in England and Wales but ultimately we don't make the rules it'll be what the government decides to do that will influence where things end up. There's a lot of attention at the moment on investing in the UK. In due course what the government wants pension funds to do in this space will become, will become clear. But what's very clear is that we have a duty to run the pension fund with regard to the best interests of scheme members. And in general, the best interests of scheme members are defined in financial terms. And while we can take uh, non-financial factors into account, we can only really do so where they pose a risk to the future value of an investment, climate change being the most obvious area where that might be the case. But that doesn't mean we can't invest in the UK. We've very successfully invested in a whole number of things in the UK where the returns have been in line with the returns we would expect for any other investment in that type of asset. And at the same time, those, those investments have achieved a wider impact, for example, building new houses, creating new jobs. So as part of our approach to delivering benefit in the UK and in South Yorkshire in particular, we've invested £123 million, pounds, or 40 odd percent of our impact portfolio in Yorkshire and the Humber. So areas that directly benefit South Yorkshire. That includes a newly opened crematorium near Doncaster, which is significantly improving the environmental performance of, of uh, cremations in that area. A new 110,000 pound square foot industrial uh, unit near Barnsley and three university spin-out companies in Sheffield which are creating a significant number of new jobs. We've also financed the building of 407 new homes, which will accommodate nearly 1,200 people. We remain committed to investing in South Yorkshire, and during the current year, we'll be announcing um, that we've appointed investment managers to manage uh, a fund to invest in small and medium enterprises in the area. Hello, I'm Debbie Sharp. I started here at the Authority in November 2023. Korea has been in local government all my working life, went into pensions a good 30 odd years ago, 
and I thought it was about time that I changed uh, authorities, had a look what I could do with my experience and this opportunity came up and I've now been working here just uh, for the past year. Here at um, South Yorkshire Pensions Authority, we're looking after a lot of members' records, looking after their benefits. You'll see that we've got nearly 52,000 active members, um, nearly 65 deferred members, and 64,000 pensioners. So nearly 180,000 members in total. You'll also be interested to see that actually we've got more deferred and pensioner members than we have got active members at the moment. What is interesting of the, um, at the authority is the makeup of that membership. So across our um, active members, across our deferred members and then across the pensioner members, you'll see here that the makeup is very similar. We have far more female members of the fund than we have got male members, almost um, one to three ratio. We've also got um, 566 employers uh, at the fund now. These are the active employers who have members, members that are actually paying pension contributions each month. So data has to be collected off all of these employers on a monthly basis. So how do we look after nearly 600 employers and 18,000 members? The team is built up of four service areas. We've got the benefits team, we've got customer services, employer services, and also a technical and training team that support all of the other teams. We've got 77 team members across those areas um, spread out. The benefits team, of course, is responsible for calculating the benefits, so most of the team members sit within that team. Over the last year, month on month, completed casework has been steadily growing. You'll see that in July last year, we were looking at around about just under 12,000 cases. But if you come through to more recently, you'll see that our casework is now running sort of over 19,000 in May, 20,000 in June um, of this year. So we know that casework overall is increasing steadily. This isn't um, just an anomaly to South Yorkshire Pensions Authority. So as well as day-to-day -day casework, we've also got certain um, project areas that have to be dealt with on top of business as usual. We identified um, back in 2023 that there were backlogs and they needed to be tackled. So we've got a project in place to tackle our backlogs. Um, this is hoping to reduce them fully by the end of 2025, but this is being monitored closely. We've also got McLeod that uh, affects all pensions authorities across the country. This is the equality legislation that was brought in that said the changes back in 2014 in the local government pension scheme um, were not equitable on an age basis and the legislation brought in has ensured that anybody who has service that is protected since 2014 has, a, has to have their benefits calculated on two bases one to check whether their care benefit under the new scheme is better for them or actually if their benefit as protected under the previous schemes would have been better on a final salary basis. At present here at the authority we are able to do a check on actual benefits when they're being when somebody is retiring currently but we're not in a position yet to recalculate all of the cases back to 2014. We will be hoping to start looking at that by the middle of next year. So if anybody 
wonders what will happen is you don't need to contact us. We will be having to revisit all of our cases anyway and we will contact anybody whose benefits need to be changed because they are better under the underpin. Very few cases will the underpin be better than your career average pension that you've been building up since 2014. We've also been looking at where can we improve um, certain processes for our members. One of the areas is on the transfer out process. So we were looking to put in more robust protection for our members. We want to improve your member journey that you're getting the right information to make a very important decision. We've also been looking at where have our employers uh, still perhaps needed to take on their own responsibility for processes rather than the fund um, hand-holding. One of the areas was around about an ill health retirement. Um, here at South Yorkshire Pensions Authority, we've been supporting the employers to get a lot of the information together and obtain the information for them from the independent registered medical pre um, practitioners. Um, but it was time that the employers took on responsibility for this themselves. Um, a big thank you to all of the employers who engaged well on this and since uh, late last year, the, they've been responsible for undertaking this part of the work now. Looking at organisational changes, it had become aware that the team was not large enough to keep up with the current workloads. Um, agreement was given to increase the team and the recruitment for that is, will be underway in 24-25, so at the moment it'll take a while to actually see the improvement in the clearing of the casework. But what you will see is what happened last year is that we were able to increase the data scores with the pensions regulator and so we improved our data even with the current workforce that was in place across 23-24. Data that's being collected on a monthly basis from our employers, you'll see here that We've now got all employers giving that, that data on a monthly basis. The contributions are collected as a result of that data on a direct debit basis. And actually 92, well just over 92% were provided on time across the year. You'll also see that the engagement with the employers has shown that overall we've got a very good um, satisfaction rate with the employers. Uh, the areas that they're not satisfied, we do work with them to ensure that we can put improvements in place in processes with them. A lot of the data for our membership is now available through our online portal. You'll see here that we've got 52% of membership are actively engaged with that portal nowadays. Digital engagement isn't for everybody. We do fully understand that. And actually members don't have to use digital engagement with us. It is just there as a benefit and to ensure that um, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, if you want your information of your benefits, it's, you're, you're not waiting for the team to be reactive to a request. You can actually look for your own data. But it's also interesting to see what's the breakdown of the engagement of our membership. It's not probably all of what you might imagine. You'll see here that the biggest group of engagement is in the category of our membership between age sort of 55 and 65. Well, we've got less engagement in the younger ages, um, but that probably just shows you that uh, the people that are most engaged with their pensions are those that are getting closer to wanting their benefit. But it's important throughout your membership that you're keeping an eye on what benefits you are accruing. You'll see also we are continuing to increase our membership take up across this year we did just increase it by just under two percent but it's an area that we work on 
um, and we would like members to engage in this way just so as you can actually keep an eye and spot if you think there's anything wrong with your pay data that's on those benefits. Have a look what benefits you are accruing. Have you actually go, are you going to have enough pension in retirement? Keep an eye on it. We have got a customer service team that are front facing to take calls, face to face meetings, and you'll see 32,500 calls were answered across this year, as well as 37,000 emails with very few complaints. We do take complaints seriously, and any complaints we have are used to improve our service for our members. contact the authority in many different ways. It doesn't have to just be by phone. Use the portal, you can email us and we do still offer at the moment face to face so people can come in. We've got many routes, please use them. It's not just digital. We're trying to ensure that we include all of our membership. That the team do get asked a lot of questions around is how are my benefits accruing nowadays so how are they building up since 2014 and I mentioned earlier about McLeod the equality legislation that we're going to have to relook at cases that anybody's built up service since 2014 and this is because since then your benefits have been building up based on your pay so it's not based on your service, your hours, or your final salary like they used to be. They're based on your pay each year and they get locked in each year. The accrual rate, so the proportion of your pay that you get was increased to 1 49th from previously it was 1 60th. And if you think about this, if you've got a cake and you split it into 60 pieces, you'll get less than if you cut that cake up into 49 pieces. So how much you've been adding into your pension pot each year in the care scheme has grown with the new scheme, but it's locked in on that pay in each year. What we are going to have to do is look for anybody who's got service since 2014, the McLeod issue will look at if we recalculated that care benefit, which was 1 49th of your pay for that year, if we recalculate that as 1 60th of that piece of cake against your final salary, so that's your salary when you do leave the pension scheme, or it'll be locked in at 65 if you work longer than 65. So at the moment where you see a care benefit, what that is saying, it's based on your career average revalued earnings. So on your care average revalued earnings. Thank you for watching. Hopefully any questions that you raised previously have been covered by the speakers. If not, please check out the Frequently Asked Questions document on the website. There is also available there a transcript of this video. If you feel any questions haven't been, uh, haven't been answered, please do contact our customer services desk. Thank you for watching.